John chapter 7, starting at verse 1, it says, After these things Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of the tabernacles was at hand. His brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judah, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him. Then Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I am not yet going to the feast, for my time has not yet fully come. When he had said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. But when his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, Where is he? And there was much complaining amongst the people concerning him. Some said, He is good. Others said, No, on the contrary, he deceives people. However, no one spoke openly of him for the fear of the Jews. And so what man is doing and what John is presenting is, who is this guy? Well, we know this guy to be God. But they're making that determination. And put yourself in their place. That would have to be a hard thing. There would be the overwhelmingness of God fulfilling his scriptures and Messiah finally coming. But back then because of the Old Testament scriptures proclaiming the coming of Christ, there were many who rose up and claimed to be him, and so they're a little skeptical, as I would imagine. Well, John is writing of, of Jesus, and he's showing us, and he's presenting his, his evidence. He presented his theses in the first three verses of this gospel, and now he, he's constantly going over these proofs that show who Christ is. And so Jesus has done some pretty amazing things, and they've drawn a following. The problem with that following, although it was a mile wide, it was only an inch deep. They were people who came just because of the miracles themselves. There was the feeding of the 5,000, and as those 5,000 people were fed, they were following Christ. Just as the woman of the well, Jesus told her that, if you come to me, I'll give you torrents of living water, you'll never thirst again, and she was all for that. If she didn't have to carry the pitcher down to the well, these people didn't have to work for their bread anymore. If Christ would just multiply it and give it out, well, they were, they were good with that because he was taking care of their physical needs. But we know that Christ, he ministered to the physical for the sake of the spiritual. And again, it's the essence of the church because as Christ ministered that way, we ought to be ministering that way as well. In order to minister the gospel to people, we need to meet people where they are at. And you've heard that, that saying before. But really, what does it mean to minister to people where they are at? Well, these are people that need the gospel. So first thing I'm doing is ministering to somebody where they are at. I'm ministering to them in their sinful condition. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, Jesus looked at all of creation and he said, it's good. But after that, sin entered in, and then Paul told us in, in Romans chapter 3, there's none good, no, not one. Creation became totally corrupt, and so that's the world that we're entering into. And I was thinking, the Apostle Paul, looking at his epistles and all of his travels as he would go throughout the known world, the Med Mediterranean, the area of the Mediterranean, what would he say if he saw our society today? And I was thinking... He probably thought society had gotten better than it was. Not godly, but, but better. Because he ministered in a very ungod immoral society. Our society is going in that direction, but not quite as bad as it was back even then. But the fact of the matter is, we can complain about where our society is going, but the only way we're going to be able to change it is one person at a time as we go and we minister to those people, as we see people get saved and get right with Christ. Because again, as I've said so many times before, we so expect the world to act like the church. And the world isn't going to act like the church. The world is acting like it's acting. It's acting like the world. And so if we want things to change, then we've got to go out there and we've got to change things. And so there's Christ. Christ is walking and he's walking in the world and we see he's amongst those who do not believe or do not perceive him in the proper manner 
but he's got reason and purpose for his coming, and he's going to see his ministry fulfilled. And so he's seeing his ministry fulfilled, but then he's being rejected. But this isn't even the ultimate rejection because we know that to be the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. But here we have, after these things, after these things, obviously the things that occurred beforehand, but Christ, Christ is experiencing so much just even in between these two chapters. During, this is a six-month period because we know during the feeding of the 5,000 and during that time, it was the time of the Passover, but now it's the time of the Feast of Booths. And so between verse 71 and, uh, of chapter 6 and verse 1 of chapter 7, it's a six-month period. In between, during that time, looking at other Gospels, he fed the 4,000. The feeding of the 5,000 was predominantly to the Jews. The feeding of the 4,000 was predominantly to Gentiles. He debated again with the religious leaders, more than likely why they're seeking to kill them, kill him. He healed people. He revealed the manner by which he would die to his disciples in Matthew chapter 16. And he experienced the uh, amount of transfiguration we see in Matthew chapter 17. And again, it had to be a hard saying for his disciples to hear. And I, I think because of the difficulty of hearing that, I don't think they really did hear it. They didn't understand it or, or perceive it. But nonetheless, the Christ was going forward in his ministry. And you look at the disciples, these men who spent three years with Christ. Now, if I asked you, consider, if you were going to spend three years with anybody, getting that seminary education, who better, obviously, than the Lord Jesus Christ? But nonetheless, they still didn't have understanding. But Christ continued steadfastly in his ministry. It was going to cause him his life at the end, but even beyond that, there was going to be understanding. So consider this. I was talking to the people in children's ministry before service, and I told them they had an awesome opportunity tonight. Because you just think of the random things from your, you know, if you're some of us older people, some of the random things that come to your mind. Some of the random things that maybe somebody told you, maybe it was a teacher or a, a coach somewhere along the line, and just these, you got so much of this information in your memory bank and whatever, and there's certain things that just kind of st stick there. And now we have an awesome opportunity. Maybe tonight is one of those nights in a child's life or even in a life here in the sanctuary that something from the Word of God is truly going to stick and make that difference. Because again, Christ died upon the cross. And if you're looking at it, you think, we lost. Christianity lost because he died. Well, that's the foolishness in 1 Corinthians, the foolishness of the message. And that the, the messenger dies, but then he lives. And because he lives, so many more live as well. And so the apostles, their lives were altered. They had the teaching, but we know in Acts chapter 2, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and then Christianity spread like wildfire. So, so much has been going on. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee. Galilee is the northern portion of Israel. There's Samaria in the center this is very basic, and then Judah is in the south. And so Jesus was in the area of his hometown, not the birthplace of his town, that's Bethlehem, that's right outside of Jerusalem, but Nazareth is in the northern part. When Jesus' hometown, as I've said a few times, I never knew this until I went to Israel, but it overlooks the, ba the valley of Armageddon. And so he'll be looking at this place all the time he was growing up, where he's going to be coming back. And so right now, at this time, it's mid-October. Spring is long gone. That was chapter 6. And it's the time of the year when crops are being brought in, and now it's the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths or the Ingathering or Sakat. This is a annual reminder of God's provision during the 40 years in the wilderness. In Leviticus chapter 23, verse 34, it says, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of the seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days to the Lord. It was God's intent that the Jews would be reminded who it was who had provided for them as they wandered through the wilderness. Well, that's what Jesus was keen off of in John chapter 6. 
he was keen off of that provision. I am the bread that has come down from heaven. It was a reminder to the Jews of the present day of God's goodness in his provision every time that they brought in crops. We don't have that. Does anybody here, I'm, does anybody here have a garden that you, you grow? Sean, does, well, you did fix your garden. Okay, so you can raise your hand. That's okay. It, it, Sean used to grow weeds, but now he is growing crops. <laughs> but anyway, you know, the, the times that I have, it's just an amazing thing to see food spring out from the ground. Something you take for granted, but when you have your little garden, you, you just kind of take notice because you plant the seeds. And if you're like me, you dump a bunch of fertilizer on it and you expect it to be, you know, crops in the morning. Well, that doesn't happen, but you wait and you wait and all of a sudden they just start springing up and then you start to see them getting healthy and, and whatnot and then you're able to partake of them. And, you know, if, if, you, if you want to just get an easy kind of slam dunk thing, not taking the Lord for granted, grow zucchini. You, ever, you notice people always come in the church and they're bringing zucchini. Free zucchini to whoever wants it it's because it grows like a weed. It grows like wildfire. But again, it's an amazing thing to see these things spring up from the ground. We're not really able to have that in gathering because we're not a people of agricultural. We just partake of it. But do you ever think of thanking the Lord every time you bring the groceries in? In my mindset, I usually complain because I have to carry them in. But um, you No, know, but really, God's provision. God's provision. I mean, look at the stability of your job. We so can easily take that for granted, but God gave you that for the purpose of providing for you. Everybody that puts even a little bit of money in the agape box, part of that goes to providing for myself and my wife, and just the blessing that that is, that God provides that. We need to see the goodness of that. And so there was this, this time, this Feast of the Tabernacles, verse 2. Now the Feast of the Tabernacles was at hand, and if they only knew who it was who stood before them, this is truly the bread that has come down from heaven. Now, he announced it in chapter 6, but chapter 7, the Feast of the Tabernacles, was a remembrance. And so I believe that's what he's speaking to the churches, to re be reminded of this bread that has come down from heaven, this, that which has given us eternal life. After these things, verse 1 again, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judah, Judea, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now, there was a, I, I don't remember how far away it was. I just don't recall, but it was a pretty good bus drive from up in Galilee down to Jerusalem. It was about a three-day journey if you were to walk it, and so it was a major thing for them to go down there, to go down during that time. Jesus was destined to go because, again, uh, the men were, it was one of the pilgrim feasts, one of the three pilgrim feasts, uh, Pentecost and... Um, and uh, Passover was the, was the other one. I knew it was in there somewhere, were, were the other two. And so Christ was destined to fulfill the law, and so he was going to do these things. And so there, there was that time he was going to go down there, but his brothers confront him here in, in verse 3. These are really the half-brothers of Jesus that are spoken of elsewhere. His brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that, you, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. Now, it says a little bit, well, I'll just read all the way down to verse 5 again. For no one does anything in secret why he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him. So this encouragement isn't coming from a pure heart. This encouragement is coming from a place of unbelief. And the idea here is, is that these, these brothers of his are, are trying to force his hand for him to reveal himself to them. Now, theologically speaking, there's been much debate, did Jesus have brothers or did he not? Now, Mary was a virgin at her conception. There's no doubt about that. The Bible is very clear about that. It's a fulfillment of prophecy. But why would it be necessary for her and Joseph to not partake in normal marital relations? And they did. And these were the children that were produced. Now, my wife brought up something very interesting the other day. My brother had named all of his kids, and some people have done that. My brother, they were all in kids. Nathan, Nariah, Nerissa, Noel, and Nikhil. And so they, they, they went with the N thing for some reason. Well, it seems like Mary and Joseph went with the J thing. 
except for one case. So anyway, it says in, in Mark chapter 6, verse 3, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the mother, or the, sorry, the brother of James, Joses, Judas, and Simon? I don't know why they changed with Simon. They probably got tired of the J thing. And not his sisters here with us, and they were offended at him. Now this is a fulfillment of prophecy once again. In Psalm 69, verse 8, I have become a stranger to my brothers and alien to my mother's children. Now again, it seems like his brothers are encouraging them, but I think it's for their benefit, because again, what is man doing? They're examining the Christ, and who is this man? Now, now think of his brothers growing up with, with a brother who is completely perfect in everything that he did. He never fights, he never argues, never heard him say a bad word, never saw him steal anything, and again, perfect, but when your brother goes out and proclaims the things that Jesus proclaims, it's a hard thing for the family that remains because, well, is this really true? And apparently they didn't believe it. Well, they weren't believers. They didn't believe it was true. And so it had to be a hard thing for the family to be out there. And aren't you the family of, of, of Jesus? What's up with him? What is he doing? And so they're telling him, hey, if this is really true of you, go down to Jerusalem and present yourself for who you are. Now, they're aware of, I'm sure, that six months previously, he just lost a whole bunch of disciples. In John chapter 6, verse 66, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. And so they're trying to force his hand so that he would be revealed for who he says that he is. And, and so then in verse 6, Jesus responds. Then Jesus said to them, and it's very profound what he says here, my time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. Your time is always ready. My, and when he says my time, he's talking about the time of his death. But your time could happen at any time. See, Jesus had an appointed day of his death. You have an appointed day of your death, but Jesus knew what his was. You don't know what yours is. And the problem is, they're not prepared for the day of their death. And that's where really, as Jay Vernon would say, the rubber meets the road. The only way that man can possibly be prepared for the day of his death is to know for sure that he has that right relationship with Jesus Christ. We call it having our affairs in order, and we can so set our affairs in order. But unless you got your heart taken care of, the inner man, the person who communes with God, or even have that communion, communion with God, then you're by no means prepared for that day of death. And the problem is it could happen at any time. It's amazing. We, we're losing airplanes now. And, and I don't mean that to be funny, but we lost that one airplane in the Pacific, what, a year ago or so, and now they lost another one going from, um, it was France, going from France to Egypt. And they, how do you lose an airplane? More than likely it's crashed into the ocean and probably sunk to the bottom or whatever. I, what do I know? I don't have a clue. But nonetheless, just think of everybody that got on that airplane. What was their, their expectation that as they got on the airplane, they will be getting off of the airplane in Egypt? And then I, I often wonder, you know, especially in an airplane, because I, I don't know if a bomb exploded and their death was instant, or if it was from the time it went from the altitude it was at to, to, the, to the ocean. But I often wonder what their thoughts were. What their thoughts were. Because it's at that time that you are going to face truth in its purest form. You're going to face truth in all of its reality. Because you're not going to muddy it up with your expectations for the future. Because, again, just think of that short period of time that they had to live and the considerations. And so if the gospel has been given to them, the, the gospel on the Holy Spirit is going to bring it to their memory at that point and the decisions they made. And there's just think, not really, think of the, the, the true conviction of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And I'm just going to speak in just general terms. Let's just say they had, let's say they had 30 seconds to live from the time they realized something was wrong until their lives ended. Now, again, God is gracious. And as God is gracious, he's going to give them opportunity. Again, you can read this from cover to cover, and you can see God's going to give them every opportunity. And how much more so just before they die? 
And so the, 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 those people who are on the airplane, they knew of the gospel, every single one of them. How do I know that? Because the Bible says every mouth will be stopped. In Romans chapter 3, verse 19. That being the case, it has to be the reason man has no excuse because he either was well aware of the gospel or could have been well aware of the gospel. And so were those people aware of the day of their death? Had they made that decision for Christ, were they prepared? Now, as they had this 30 seconds, proverbial 30 seconds of time, they could have made the decision. They could have made the decision and turned their hearts to Christ. And I, I pray that they all did but I know the hard-heartedness of man. I, I would imagine there were probably some who, as they were going down, even cursed the Lord, cursed the Lord to his face. Jesus said to them, my time has not yet come, but your time is always ready, always ready. I was surprised the day that my dad died, he was still getting his will together. He had cancer for, he had known of cancer for about five or six months. And of the day of his death, they finally brought the, the will over to his house after they had it all done and how, had it how he wanted it. I still haven't seen it to this day, so I don't know how it was in there. and doesn't matter, but he finally had it how he wanted it. But by that time, he was ill-prepared to sign it. He couldn't sign the will. And what they did is they had to make an X, and then my brother signed it as a witness, and so that if anybody... I, I probably won't challenge it. I don't think any of my family would, but I imagine that could be challenged because there's not the definite signature there. But I'm just thinking, that's so unlike my mother and my father to be ill-prepared for that day. Well, how much more so spiritually speaking are so many people so ill-prepared? And just think of somebody that had that 30 seconds if they could come back and what they would say. Well, we have the Lord Jesus Christ who came back. We don't need that testimony. We have the testimony of God. And again, Christ is telling his brothers, my time has not yet come. The interesting thing about God is, is God exists outside of the constraints of time. But now he has moved within the constraints of time. We're told in the beginning was God. At the beginning of time was God. God existed before the beginning of time. In, in John chapter 1 when it says in the beginning, it's the Greek word arche, in the beginning was the word, it means for eternity past, God exists. But now God has moved within the constraints of time. And as he has done so, he is experiencing time as we experience it. He's experiencing it sequentially. See, God before would look over all time because God inhabits eternity. We're, we're told that in, in the book of Isaiah. God exists in our future, and that's how we know that all things are under his control, and we're just simply, in this life, we're moving into the things that God has prepared before us. But look at it this way. When I go to visit my mother, I live in Ontario, my mother lives in Brea. And consider this as, as a person's life. As I go... I leave my house, I get on the freeway, I drive through Chino, I drive through Pomona, kind of go over the little hills to the interchange, the 60, 57 interchange there. I go by Diamond Bar, and I usually get off in Brea Canyon, and I drive through the canyon and turn right on Central and go over to her house. And it's just one thing at a time. I'm very used to it, and everything's familiar, and so on and so forth. God, it's as if he is sitting above all of that. He sees my mom waiting for me at her house. He sees me getting in my car. He understands that there's a traffic jam that is over here, understands that it's clear over here, and maybe there's danger here, and it'd be better if I took that way. And so he's got the information. He's able to guide. Myself, at the beginning of my trip, I'm just able to make the best guess. I just take the familiar route. I'm kind of the same place, same thing kind of a guy. So I'll usually go the same way but I've got somebody watching over me. And as if I have, you know, if I had somebody in an airplane that went before me, they could tell me of all the things in my future that was going to happen. Again, Mike, there's, there's an accident here. Don't go that way. Take this different route. Well, if I had that person and I had the communication with that person, just think of all the hardship that I'd be able to avoid. In my future, I would know, well, to a degree, my future is taken care of. Well, we have that. We have that in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
He ever lives to make intercession for us. He watches over us and he keeps us. And as long as I'm in that, making that communication with him, he's taking care of my future. And so again, tonight, whatever God has for me in, in store for me tonight, I hope it's not much more than an ending of service and going to bed, but nonetheless, I, I have the security that he's, getting, he's taking care of it. If I was to get in an airplane in France and go think at least I was going to Egypt, God would have it all taken care of. Not that I wouldn't die, but if I did die, at that point I'd be more alive than I've ever been. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He's got my future taken care of. I, I've done all of my estate planning in Jesus Christ, and it's in his hand. And there's no better place for it to be. The brothers, they've got issues. They, 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 the death is imminent for all of them, but there's their salvation standing right before them. And at this point, they don't recognize it. We know James. James went on to write the epistle of James. Jude went on to write the epistle of Jude. James called himself a bondservant of Jesus Christ. He came to the realization of who truly his brother is. And as he did, it was his desire that other people would come to this knowledge that he came of Jude as well. We don't hear about the other brothers, but nonetheless, everybody makes their decision. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 for he says, in an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Why is now, why is today the day of salvation? Because today could very well be the day of death as well. Verse 7, the world cannot hate you, cannot reject them to the degree that has rejected Christ. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. People don't like to be exposed. As people are exposed for who they are, there, there's just that, that reaction, that knee-jerk reaction that comes. I had a, th th this was not me in my finest moment, but I had a friend whose wife um, was a constant complainer. I, I don't remember exactly what it was, but I remember telling Terry, man, that per she's always complaining. Well, I was going to a game somewhere with my son, Sean, who was young at the time, and this woman's husband. And uh, I don't remember, he said something about his wife, and I go, yeah, yeah, your wife's a good woman, da-da-da-da. And then Sean says, I thought you said she complained all the time. <laughs> I don't remember what I said, other than, shut up, Sean. But she was a complainer. He wasn't lying. But you don't want to cause that friction. Well, just a mere mention of Christ is going to be the dividing point. Because it's in Christ that we see the perfection of God. He's the image of the glory of the invisible God. It's in Christ that I see my imperfections and unsaved state that lifetime that I have spent trying to cover all of those imperfections. See, I've been tiling my shower, and some of the tiles aren't exactly straight. It, it, it's not a perfect job, because I'm an imperfect person. But what have I been doing for the last two days? Smearing grout. And the good thing about grout is, even though something might be off a little bit, when you put the grout in, it, it just makes it look straight, and it makes it look clean, and it makes it look good. Now, when I look at that, I'm thinking, man, it looks good, but I, to my mind comes those imperfections that are there. And I can look really good, but apart from Christ, but my imperfections are, are always there. And if you point out one of my imperfections, I'm not necessarily going to appreciate that. And then if I see Christ and all of my imperfections are exposed, there's going to be a reaction. Reaction of one or two things, either rejection or acceptance. Because Christ is there with his hands open. As we come to Christ, it's then that our imperfections, that our sins, are cast as far as the east is from the west. But if I reject him, then it's hiding in the bushes with fig leaves such as Adam and Eve. The world cannot hate you, verse 7, but it hates me because I testify of it, I expose it, that its works are evil. You go up to this feast 
I am not yet going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. When he had said these things to him, to them, he remained in Galilee. So the idea of him remaining in Galilee is he just did not go with them. But, again, there's this Feast of Booths. Men are going to be gathered together in Jerusalem, and they're going to be camped out, if you will, in these makeshift booths as a reminder of how God provided for them. But there's something deeper and richer in this and how man is going to be provided for. Now, again, he was just talking to his brothers, these people who were unsaved, although some of them, if not all of them, would get saved eventually. And so we've got this rich picture of what Christ would later tell his disciples. Go ahead and turn over to John chapter 14. Now, Jesus had just said that, that he is going to give of his life for them. And well, actually, I'll look at, at chapter 13, verse 36. Actually, verse 31. So when he had gone out, this is in John 13, 31. So when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. Little children, I shall be with you a little longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And so he's leaving final instructions, but he had been speaking of his death. And then Peter once again chimes in, verse 36. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterwards. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. Jesus answered him, will you lay down your life for my sake? Most surely I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. And so Jesus' death, as it is the death that matters here, it is unique unto itself. Jesus was not to be... I mean, just think what happened if Jesus was crucified with all of the apostles. We'd be calling them all our Savior, at least certain denominations would. But no, Christ's cross stood by itself amongst the sinners, amongst the, the two other thieves upon the cross. And so, Peter, this day is not for you. This day is for Christ and for Christ alone. Jesus said again in verse 36, where I am going cannot follow me. We know that Christ had to be the first fruits or had to go, had to die first. But you will follow me afterwards. But the good thing he could tell Peter, don't worry about it because even though I am going, and it's what he's saying here in chapter 14, I'm going to prepare a place for you. You're going to go one day, not right now though. Again, verse 14, even as Jesus told them of everything that's going to happen, that these men have given their lives to Christ, and now Christ is going to be crucified, he says, let not your heart be troubled. Don't be troubled. But, you know, it's easy to say, don't worry about it. Don't, but to say don't worry about it doesn't make any sense. It's got to be based upon something that soothes your worry. And so Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled, or don't worry about it. You believe in God, believe also in me. Believe in, so where is our hope? Our hope is to be based upon the belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2, in my fathers are many mansions, many dwelling places. There's going to be many places for many people. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. So, Peter, you say you want to die with me. We know he's not going to be able to do that. But Jesus says it's not necessary for you to do that. Matter of fact, it's better that it doesn't happen because what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and I'm going to prepare a place for you and your time. And he'll talk about this at the end of the Gospel of John. But in time, you're going to go to, we know he went to Rome and he was crucified upside down because he was, Peter always going to extremes, he was not worthy to be crucified as his Lord was crucified. And he would go, but he's going to that place. Why would they give up their lives because they knew they had a place prepared for them. And that's what makes all the difference. That's why men and women throughout the history of the world were willing to give of their lives for Christ, knowing that it wasn't in vain, because they had a place prepared for them by the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Because of that, people went out on the mission field. Because of that, people got over themselves and went down the street. Wherever it might have been that God had called them to preach that message, they understood the priority of their lives. is not building a kingdom here on earth, because that is so temporary, but is to build an eternal kingdom in God, in, in the kingdom of heaven, because Christ had gone to prepare that place. Go ahead and turn back to chapter 7. And when he had said these things to them, verse 9, he remained in Galilee, verse 10. But when his brothers had gone up then, he also went up to the feast, not openly, but as it were, in secret. So it's not his time yet. He's not wanting to draw a lot of attention to himself. So he, he wanders in without the crowd sending people ahead of him. Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, where is he? And there was much complaining amongst the people concerning him. Some said he is good. Others said no, on the contrary, he deceives the people. However, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. Now, basically three parties there. There's the re religious establishment who didn't accept him because of, well, he's contrary to them. But then there were the much complaining amongst the people. Who do you think they were? They're the John chapter 6, verse 66 people. Why are they complaining about him? Why are they calling him a deceiver? Because he didn't do what they thought that he should be doing. He didn't do what they wanted him to do. We put our trust in him, but see, they didn't put their trust in him for their salvation. They put their trust in him. I was watching it on TV the other day. The people are still there. They're preaching their gospel of health and wealth, and they're deceiving people because Christ your, your, your wealth that you have, I'm talking about physical wealth, has nothing to do with the spiritual wealth that we have in heaven. Moth can eat it, rust can destroy it, but as far as our salvation, it's hidden in Christ. And so we've got three people here, three types of people here. Now, it's kind of an amazing thing. What are they doing? They're in God's place of prayer, and they're planning on destroying the only means by which their prayers are heard, Jesus Christ. And see, you see the fallacy of mankind here. But these three groups of people, first, is Jesus a good man? Is, is he a good man? Some said that he's good. The Old Testament, Jesus in the Gospel, and the New Testament all tell us that there are no good men. Again, Genesis 1.31 Men was, mankind was good at creation, but from there, he was defiled. Good, good means to be totally free from any sort of corruption or desire to corrupt. It's a Old Testament concept, Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 20, for there is not a just man on earth who does good and does not sin. Job chapter 15, verse 14, what is man that he could be pure, and he was born of a woman that he could be righteous? And obviously the answer is they can't. And then in the New Testament, I'm not going to go there, but in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, there are none good. And, and, and Paul just hammers that point home. And so Jesus is far from just a good man, because if he's just a man, the Bible tells me that men are not good. Mankind is not good. The people were thinking that he was such a good teacher, prophet, he was wise, he fed the poor and healed the sick. But the thing about it is, even a corrupt man could do that. And unfortunately, you see churches that make those things the center of their ministry, but if you make that the center of the ministry, then you're not fulfilling what Christ has called you to do. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't feed the poor and, 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 and care for the sick and so on and so forth, but what is it that to be the center of our ministry? Well, if they're sinners, if they're not good, we need the only solution that's offered so that they would be prepared for the day of their death. We need to give them the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It has to be the center of our ministry because Jesus was so much more than just a good man. Or secondly, some said he's a deceiver. Maybe he's just some crazy person who drew people to himself and went to the cross. We've seen people that have done such things, but, well deceiving for 2,000 years to impact the world such as he has 
to, 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 to come alive in the hearts of people, to say that if he goes to his Father, he's going to send the Holy Spirit. And see the Holy Spirit that has come and changed the world, well, the proofs are undeniable that Christ is who he says he is, that he is truly the author of all truth. And then there's one possibility, and I'm going to close with this, and it's not really mentioned here. I, I really believe that it's implied here, but it's not mentioned. Maybe he's the one who has been promised. Maybe he is that one. It's why so much attention is given to him. Maybe Jesus Christ is Lord. Maybe he is God. Maybe he is Savior. And it's something that we can't wait until the end. We don't know what time we're going to have. But it's that realization that those people who were in that airplane that they came to. They came to that realization, again, based upon the grace of God. And God desires that nobody would perish, but all would come to a saving knowledge of him. They all came face to face with the reality of who Christ is. And I'd have to imagine, even if it was a millisecond, that they had to have that opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. It's the magnitude of the grace of God, and it's also how God is beyond time. But the problem is we're not beyond time. And so we can't wait to that last minute. We can't wait to that last minute for ourselves or our salvation. I'm probably talking to the majority of people here. I pray that you're saved. Or I can't wait to that last minute to share God's word because I, I never know of that day of somebody's visitation. John chapter 20, verses 27 through 28. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Now, nowhere are we told that Thomas did that. But what did he see? He simply saw the wounds of the crucified Christ. And it was because of that that he responded to him, my Lord and my God. We have Jesus here. Jesus here who's gone to prepare a place for us. That even though Israel back then would celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, I am to have a dwelling place in the presence of my Father in heaven. Through Jesus Christ. Who Jesus Christ who had that ordained time that ordained time that he went to the cross to die for the sins of the world, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. You're born again here tonight, you have everlasting life. This world, this world is as hard and as difficult as it gets. And the Bible says that time, that time is only for, it's only a vapor. It's only a vapor that quickly comes and quickly leaves. But eternity Eternity is the presence of God worshiping him forever. Father, we just thank you for these rich things that you have given us, these great promises. And I, I pray, Father, that we would be a people that, again, would possess them, that we would grasp onto them and, and Father, understand that, Lord, your word is given, to, is given to me. It's given to me personally because, Father, I so needed what you had to offer. And so, Father, I pray that we would take personal possession of your word, but I pray, Father, that which you have freely given to us, we would also freely give to others. And so, Lord, as time is truly of the essence, I pray, Father, that we would move forward in all diligence. And so, Lord, we just thank you for this evening. I pray for this weekend, as we have a busy weekend. I pray for tomorrow night, our, our time of prayer. I pray for Saturday morning, the men's breakfast. Pray, Father, for our sister Penny, who is moving. Pray, Lord, that she would get all moved in. And, and just pray for our church services on Sunday, our leadership meeting on Sunday night. God, that you would just simply go before us in all that we do, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you all stand, please? A couple of announcements. I talked to Penny before service. She thinks that she'll probably get moved in um, tomorrow. She, we're thinking she may need some help on Saturday. I'll be announcing it at the breakfast. So after breakfast, uh, it might be a need for some men to go over there and to help her. We'll see and we'll let you know. Um, Reaching Forward Conference. It's our marriage conference that we're having. You can sign up here at the church or sign up online. Uh, it, there's a man who sponsors us on the radio and he sponsors a couple other ministries and he's gathering us together and we're going to have a marriage conference here at our church on June 4th. 
And so I encourage you, if God's speaking to you, to sign up. But also we need help. We're, we're planning, we've been getting quite a few sign-ups. We're planning on filling the place up. So we're going to need some ushers and some, some greeters and, and whatnot, just people to help out and to direct people. We're, we've gotten people from, from Whittier to Corona to Fontana, and I think there was somebody from Upland. So just in this greater area, uh, La Mirada. And so uh, we're going to have people that are very unfamiliar with our church. And so awesome opportunity to reach out. And the intent is, is to reach into the body of Christ without a doubt, but even more so to reach outside of the body of Christ also. Uh, breakfast, we are having our men's breakfast. And yes, you can still sign up for the men's breakfast. But if you want to serve the Lord tonight, we have that opportunity as we're going to be setting the chairs up here in the sanctuary. So what we need to be doing are the tables. What we need to do is what we usually do is to set the chairs up into groups of six, and we'll have a dolly, and we'll carry them out of the way, and then to roll, uh, Sal will be directing, but we need to uh, set up 12 tables as well. Other than that, God bless you guys, and good night.